the best things you can say about 2019, unlike last year, just about every asset has gone up. Bonds have gone up, stocks have gone up, and in certain cases, commodities. Joining us on the program is Frank Holmes. Frank, uh, I want to begin our discussion as we always do. Let's take a look at the gold markets right now. Gold is up for the year. Recently, it's pulled back a little bit. So let's begin with gold. What's your take here with so many of the sovereign debt outstanding is in negative territory? Well, the important thing to hear to recognize is, is a very strong inverse relationship to real negative interest rates. And what does that mean? It means what is the government going to try to seduce you with to buy their bonds minus the CPI number? So if you look at five-year government bonds or 10-year uh, and you take away the CPI number, is that a positive rate of return or a negative? That is what a real interest rate is. And when gold hit 1,900, real interest rates for 10-year government bonds in the U.S. hit minus 300 basis points. And then they rallied to plus 200, almost 300 basis points, a 600 basis point swing. And that's what took gold down to 1,000. And then immediately it popped back up. And so recently this year, we're seeing more going to negative real interest rates in the U.S. has gone and the rest of the world. What's also interesting is the overall percentage of government bonds uh, that are negative. So it peaked in August. August the 28th was the greatest percentage of of uh, the G20 countries, which were providing, uh, offering you a negative real interest rate on their on their government bonds, and that was the highest in the price of gold. Now, subsequent uh, to that, the uh, rates have sort of peaked back up. They're still basically negative, and uh, and the price of gold is sold off and is corrected. And I'm a big believer that this is just a normal cycle that gold has this big rally uh, going into September. Uh, it peaked a little earlier this year, and then it sells off in October, and then we get the big rally going again. So I may remain from that very positive and constructive. I would say that to your listeners that prior to 2008, the G20 finance ministers are acting like OPEC. Even though it's illegal in the U.S., they conduct themselves like a cartel. And they were totally consumed with global trade and economic activity. And since 2008, uh, starting in 2009, they became totally consumed with synchronized taxation and regulation. And that's a big paradigm shift in the flow of funds. We have a war of China on trade, but we've had a war on money for a while now. Uh, and, and you're seeing it with the cost of uh, anti-money laundering laws in the past 19 years, 18 years, has gone up dramatically from a billion dollars a year to $3 billion a month now globally. Uh, and, and the ability that we used to have uh, in our mutual funds, people from outside of the country can invest them, no longer that's allowed. Um, so the flow of money itself has had its own sort of trade war, and now we're seeing it in that economic engine, and a lot of that has to do with the G20, and why I'm trying to explain this is so important, is that the G20 uh, countries do not want to go to streamlining regulations or lowering taxation. They're trying to do it with cheap money. They're trying to stimulate economic growth by basically saying, here, money is free. Um, and that has its inherent flaws, and that makes real assets uh, from art to gold to real estate um, show spectacular performance. And if you look back long term for the past 20 years, the best performing asset class has been REITs. Number two is bullion. And then we take a look this year, REITs and bullion have also done exceptionally well. Frank, continuing with that thread, increased regulation, increased taxation, cheap money, debasing the currency. But it's also carried over here, too, as well, not just the trade war, because if you look at the presidential election, we're talking about, you know, I call it the election, lots of free stuff that other people pay for, free housing, free education, free student loans, uh, you know, annual guaranteed income, expansion of Medicare for everybody. Isn't this basically expanding that same concept, but now it's hitting the U.S.? Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to add to that comment. You know, one of the things that President Trump is so worried about, illegals coming across the border, uh, but legally what's been coming across the border that's most dangerous are EU socialist policies. And that's what's really led to Brexit. And they're so clever. Uh, they, they 
sugarcoat everything. I wrote a piece on this a couple of weeks back. And if you go back into when, when the slavery ships were coming across the Atlantic, they had words for the names of the ships like hope and liberty. <laughs> like, I don't think so. All right. And, and just like the Patriot Act wasn't very patriotic, how many rights you lost. And, um, and we can go on with some word choices. So now they're talking about harmonization of regulation and taxation really means they're trying to force America to raise their taxes and regulations to that of the EU. And, and if you really want to look at it at flying at 50,000 feet, I'm a, my opinion is this has been a big part of Brexit. The reason for the pushback, the anti uh, being with the EU is because the EU has crushed the London Stock Exchange. There's a formation of capital. It was number two in the world behind New York. Um, and uh, they've just burdened manufacturers of beds, chairs, whatever uh, in, in England. And so this is a pushback against the socialist mindset. And when you go over there and, and, and working, it's so expensive. It really shocks you how expensive it is. And the average person, a, a young waiter was telling me in Milan, um, that's from New York, and he went over there because he had a new baby and he can't get paid more than 1200 bucks a month. And in Italy, they took off a, a line item where you, where you can tip someone. So they don't want, they don't think it's fair that you get a tip for good service. And so it's very difficult to make ends meet. So everyone's basically uh, um, hand to mouth, but that's, that's the model of, of Europe. Well, Frank, when you, you take a look at that historically, when you get high taxation, high regulation, debasement of the currency through cheap money, traditionally that has been an inflationary force, and that's been positive for gold. It has, you know, and I think that uh, gold is doing what I think it's important is to do, and there's all the other factors, like I mentioned before, that we're we're, exper- we're experiencing peak supply, and uh and so we're we're going to see that the uh, supply from gold mining is going to decline, and I think that that's another important part in this whole equation. Uh, and, and I also like that what I've really noticed is the Bank of International Settlements, which I never really paid a whole lot of time and effort on, but I really saw Jim what they did with uh, Bitcoin, how aggressive and anti they were everything on Bitcoin. It just wasn't rational to me that the head of the Bank of International Settlements was everywhere speaking on and on and on. And then I did some additional work with it and find out that they're involved with all the gold swaps. And basically, they are the clearinghouse for 60 banks around the world. And uh, they they care more about a worthless piece of paper out of Venezuela than they do the preservation of someone owning gold or owning a Bitcoin. So I think that that's sort of like... It's so easy to see the war on the bitcoins of the, uh, right now in, in the overall, but it's much more stealth to see, but it's still against gold because they're continuous with their paper money printing. But eventually, all of a sudden, it snaps. You know, there's a, there's, is, is, uh, the great, uh, hedge fund manager, George Soros called it, that it, it goes a quantum leap. It just happens, and uh, it goes exponential, and then all of a sudden it goes on baselines along a new reset button. And I think that uh, that's what I've written about, and I've talked that I think you can see gold at ten thousand dollars now. And I don't think you need to have the wars coming to the world's coming to an end. I think there's going to be a, a, a reset button. Uh, with this sort of refusal to deal in a streamlining regulations around the world and uh, lowering taxes in the battle really as as citizens against governments that are looking for taxing to run their big governments. You know, Frank, on the day you and I are speaking, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook is before Congress. Both parties really hostile towards him, and especially his idea of coming up with a cyber currency called the Libra. I mean, he was really getting hammered on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because, and that's the whole thing why the Bank of International Settlements, they don't want to crypto money because they want to control the paper. They want to control against their socialist policies uh, and how they coordinate. And uh, so I, I think it's interesting uh, that the Bitcoins of the world, they all sell off into these meetings. Uh, if you look at the past 18 months, big sell-offs every time there's a meeting with Congress or the Senate or the SEC hearings, and then we get a bounce back up. So there's a lot of sentiment in that space. 
But what Zuckerberg is doing is, is a, and it scares the banks. Um, and you can see the moral suasion in the Federal Reserve getting the MasterCards, the Visa, everyone not to support it, and PayPal, um, and and for it because it really is an incredible threat to them because he has so much data. Uh, and with AI today uh, on his customers, and he has two billion. He has data on two billion people around the world. And um, but what happens if that crypto coin is? Steve Forbes wrote to uh, Zuckerberg and said to him, uh, "Please, well, why don't you have twenty percent? I believe it was twenty percent uh, behind each of these. The new coin, the Libra, be gold, and that would be the reset button for the rest of the world. Well, if that was to happen, gold's going to be five thousand wow. dollars." But but coming back on, I think it's really important to watch uh, that the, the, the concern by so many uh, uh, regulars because they want to control that and they don't have that access that he has. And so I think there's going to be a wrestling, but I think the crypto space is going to uh, uh, continue to grow. And, and and the other one is remember. J.P. Morgan paid uh, people to say negative things, economists about Bitcoin. They trash talked it all the way down to 3,000. And then this year they came out in February with their own coin. And that was the bottom in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin then climbed to 8,000. And then Facebook came out and talked about they're not going to have a coin. And it went to 14,000. And then every regulatory body went after it. And then it sold off to under 8,000. But there's something that's really important to recognize is that this digital money is for real. And uh, it's it's a wrestling match between governments trying to control it. I want to switch gears quickly and talk about another metal that's used every single day, and that is copper. Copper has been hitting lows because of concerns about global growth, but Frank, we're running annual supply deficits in copper, and if we're moving towards electric cars, I mean, the average Tesla has 130 pounds of copper, we're going to be consuming more copper. All this high-tech and clean energy stuff that we're talking about consumes copper. What's your take on copper here? Because it's in the doldrums, despite huge supply deficits that are growing every year. You know, it's one of the most crowded uh, short trades. Uh, and, and I think that what's important for the listeners is that we write about it every month when, we, when the global PMI, that is Purchasing Manufacturers Index, comes out. Uh, we write it and we analyze the China versus e- Europe, Germany, France, and uh, we do regressional studies on how predictive it is. So if the one month is above the three months or the one month is below the three months, well, how does it impact copper, steel, oil? Um, and why is that important? Because PMI is a six-month leading indicator. So if you get a big order to uh, make uh, copper mo- motors with copper, then uh, all of a sudden, your, the manufacturer PMI starts to pick up, and you're going to consume a lot of energy to make those motors. Uh, and so that's why, and it's going to take at least six months to deliver those motors. Uh, that's why it's a good leading indicator. And, uh, and and it started about 18 months ago turning south, and then as the trade wars accelerated, then the PMIs of Europe have come, fallen below 50, uh, China fell below 50, came back up, but the world is, is very precarious at this stage. But any settlement with trade in China that's meaningful, the PMIs go one month above the three months, Copper can jump 40%. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because everyone is short. The demand is there like you're talking about. We're running into a deficit. And, and also, all you have to do is have the problems like Chile. You have a crisis in Chile, and that's another classic a, a case study where the government um, uh, took away a benefits for tax break for fuel the people said, I'm going to have to pay more for my fuel. They ride in the streets. They burn things. And the government could have simply said, yeah, we're going to give you a payroll tax. So it's not going to come out of your pocket. But, oh, no, the government's not going to do that there. They're going to take it because they've got their own agenda of building their own government. And um, and so you get this turmoil that people are getting very upset about the government reaching into their pockets. And uh, and I think that this is a classic example. Supply of copper all of a sudden can't leave the country, uh, and copper starts to have a pop. So, Frank, given where the markets are right now, and especially gold is looks like it's in a consolidation phase, what would you tell investors to be doing? I love copper, but what about gold and copper right now? Well, c- copper, we have BHP is one of my biggest holders in global resources. And one of my best specs, you know, optionality, is Copper Bank. It's a little tiny penny stock. 
Um, and uh, Gianni has wrote in a book, the CEO uh, on copper, uh, drove his Tesla all across America, uh, and he basically has uh, over 10 pounds of copper, you know, over $10 of copper behind every share. Uh, and that's a big number, you know, that's, uh, so you're buying for optionality. And when the PMIs do turn positive, because they always do, and copper starts this, this surge, then stocks like that can go up five or six fold. So we own things like that in addition to BHP. All right. Well, Frank, if our listeners would like to follow, you're a very prolific writer. How could they do so? Well, go to usfunds.com and sign up for Investor Alert and Frank Talk and uh, take a look at our ETFs. We talk about uh, 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 the idea of using data sets to analyze uh, companies, etc. Well, we created GoAU, which is a uh, gold equity ETF. We spent 8,000 hours doing the regressional work on it, and it's outperformed the GDXJ. Um, and models that it would outperform over 90% of the time. And since we launched it in the past two years, it's done that. And it's so performed all the active gold fund managers. So I think that you'll learn about more about the quant metrics of looking at picking stocks in addition to the macro forces by signing up at usfunds.com for Frank Talk. All right, Frank. Well, listen, as always, pleasure having you on the program. All the best. All right. Happy investing. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. 